Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Patriot 20th Anniversary Commentary brought to you by the Culture and Heritage Museums of York County. I'm Zach Lemhouse, the staff historian for the Culture and Heritage Museums and director of the Southern Revolutionary War Institute. Joining me today are Joe Mester and Kevin Lynch. Joe is the historic preservationist at Bradensville, and Kevin is the site director at Bradensville. The purpose of this commentary is to provide some historical context and address some inaccuracies in the Columbia Pictures film, The Patriot. The Patriot, set in revolutionary South Carolina, tells the story of Benjamin Martin, a French and Indian War veteran who is haunted by his past. Martin wants nothing more than to live peacefully with his family. However, after British Colonel William Tavington burns Martin's home and kills his son, he decides to take up arms against the British to help turn the tide of the American Revolution in the South. The Patriot has a very unique connection to the culture and heritage museums. Some of the movie's most memorable scenes were filmed on location at historic Bradensville. Without any further delay, let's get started. To sync this commentary with your version of The Patriot, simply pause the commentary when instructed to do so. Once you've paused this commentary, press play on your version of The Patriot. When the Centropolis Entertainment logo fades to black, press play again on this commentary. Everyone ready? Three, two, one, pause. The sweet corn we just saw depicted um, was not widely cultivated by most European um, Americans or Europeans in the mid uh, until the mid 19th century. Uh, the corn eaten by the majority of South Carolinians in the Revolutionary era was field corn grown in, ground into meal or flour. Field or dent corn is a much hardier crop than the sweet corn depicted. The, uh, the body alphabet that we see the Martin children playing with is commonly known as the comical hotchpotch alphabet. It was originally printed in London in 1782 by Carrington Bowles. Considering that this scene is set in 1776, the Martin children would not have been using this particular kind of alphabet.
The main protagonist of the film is Benjamin Martin, played by Mel Gibson. Martin is a fictional character that is predominantly based on partisan militia leader Francis Marion. In fact, in the original version of the script, Gibson's character was called Francis Marion. The character of Benjamin Martin also contains elements of Thomas Sumter, Andrew Pickens, and Daniel Morgan. In the backdrop of these scenes, you've noticed this barn. Uh, this barn was purposefully built for this movie. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting notes about the materials that they're using, they're actually using circular saw lumber. Um, circular saw lumber was not widely available um, to South Carolinians until the mid 19th century. Um, so it's an interesting, they're trying to make it look rustic. So they're using saw lumber, which they had mills or uh, pit saws um, and they would have sawn it, but they wouldn't have been using a, a mill uh, with a circular saw at that time. So in the 1770s, metal workers were crafting inexpensive two-dimensional tin soldiers, colloquially referred to as flats. The fully rounded three-dimensional figures that are in this scene and feature prominently throughout the film would not have been readily available until the late 19th century. One of the things you'll see throughout this film is the abundance of candles. Uh, in the 18th century, in the 19th century, uh, candles, you'd use one or two in a room, maybe. Here it looks like, uh, you know, there's like maybe 15 in this room, but uh, for movie magic, they sure do look nice. So here they are riding into Charleston. Now, what's interesting about this scene is it's kind of a hodgepodge of streets. It's not necessarily one specific street. Meeting Street is used prominently for the Charleston scenes, uh, but it's a little bit of a, um, a lot of computer graphics.
the house that they're using for um, Aunt Charlotte's house is the Poyas Mordecai house at 69 Meeting Street. Um, Dr. Poyas had the Adamesque style house built in 1788. Um, and then Moses Mordecai added the piazza they're standing on after he purchased the house in 1837. Uh, one thing I noticed, the women's clothing uh, is quite common in the 18th century to wear modesty uh, cloth or neckerchiefs around the top of the body, especially on low-cut dresses. Here you don't see that in this movie very often. of the British hanging in front of the are hanging in front of the South Carolina Society Hall directly across the street from the Poyas Mordecai house. South Carolina Society Hall was designed by uh, Charlestonian Gabriel Manigro and built in 1804. In 1825 Frederick Wessner designed the classical portico that he added to the hall. historic core of the College of Charleston campus was used for the filming of the South Carolina General Assembly uh, scene that we're seeing now. Renowned uh, Philadelphia architect William Strickland designed the central block of Randolph Hall, completed in 1829. Uh, the hall they're standing in is a, in a section of that building. And in the 1850s, a prominent Charleston architect, um, Edward Brickell White, added the wings and the two-story portico you'll see um, as they exit the building. This is probably one of the most famous quotes of the film. Uh, the quote is similar to a quote that's been attributed to Mathers Biles, an American clergyman who was the nephew of New England Puritan minister Cotton Mather. In addition, I'd like to note that Charleston, South Carolina is not 3,000 miles away from England. It's more like 4,000 miles away from England. The Wilderness Campaign is mentioned several times throughout the film. It's a fictional campaign, though it's most likely based on the Grant Expedition, which was a 1761 campaign against the Cherokee in present-day Tennessee, led by Colonel James Grant. During the Revolution, Tennessee would have been known as the Wilderness Region, which is most likely why they chose to call this fictional campaign the Wilderness Campaign.
So Colonel Harry Burwell is a fictional character, but he's predominantly based on Continental Cavalry Officer Henry Light Horse Harry Lee. In fact, in the original script, Colonel Burwell is called Colonel Harry Lee. you see atop uh, Randolph Hall is is not what's actually uh, in the building itself. Uh, it doesn't actually have a bell tower. It actually has an observatory on top of the building put in around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but they CGI'd one onto this building to make it look more colonial. Uh, they also added the, the central staircase that you see um, the, the British troops marching down. The timeline can be really difficult to follow at certain points in the film. For example, here it appears that Gabriel Martin is writing this letter at Washington's winter camp at Valley Forge. However, the Continental Army camped at Valley Forge between late 1777 to mid-1778. However, this scene takes place after the fall of Charleston in May of 1780. Gabriel also mentions the Battle of Elizabethtown. This is most likely a reference to a skirmish between British and Continental forces that occurred in Elizabethtown, New Jersey during the Battle of Springfield on June 23, 1780. Another piece of uh, movie dramatic license is the paper. Often these letters you'll see in these, in these and the scenes are really brown, fade, uh, really brown, looks like old paper. 18th century, paper's white. Not, not modern copy paper white, but certainly white. They're, of course, they're making these, these letters dark for dramatic effect. So here's another example of when the timeline's a little screwy. Uh, when Thomas tells his father, quote, it's already been two years, he's stating that it's been two years since the beginning of the war, presumably in 1776. That would place this scene in 1778. But as it appears in the film, this scene occurs after the fall of Charleston in 1780. This continuity error is due to the fact that this scene was originally supposed to take place earlier in the film, two years after the events of the General Assembly meeting in Charleston. Evidently, the scene was moved to a later point in the final edit of the film, and no one noticed the continuity error.
the battle that is occurring, the one that Gabriel is describing, is a fictional one. Gabriel indicates that Horatio Gates was in command. However, Gates took command of the southern arm of the Continental Army on July 25, 1780. That would place this battle between the date and, of that date and Gates' defeat at Camden on August 16th. Horatio Gates was not involved in any major battles between those two dates. The original script suggests that this battle could possibly be the Battle of the Waxhaws. Though it does not align chronologically, Gabriel's description of Virginia regulars surrendering and being, quote, hacked to bits by British dragoons is reminiscent of the Battle of Waxhaw. you see behind uh, behind the character of Gabriel um, is known as a winnowing house and a winnowing house was used as a part of the production of, uh, of goods um, specifically wheat uh, and rice um, would have a winnowing house that's a way of separating the shaft or the or the husk off of uh, wheat grains or and or rice grains um, what's funny though is in this movie there's no depiction of wheat and or rice being grown on this plantation Here come the dragoons. Um, of course, the dragoons in the movie are wearing red, but they would have in reality been wearing green. Um, it's ironic because at several points in the film, the antagonist, Colonel William Tavington, introduces himself as the leader of the, quote, green dragoons, despite the fact that they're all wearing red. <laughs> The main antagonist, William Tavington, is fictional, but he's predominantly based on Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton. Um, he also has some character elements of Bloody Bill Cunningham and Captain Christian Huck. In the original script, the Tavington character is called Colonel Bannister Tarleton. Uh, and it should be noted that Christian Huck and uh, William Cunningham are actually both loyalists. They are not actually British. That's a good point, Joe. Thank you. So there's a, there's a lot to unpack here with that comment that the enslaved person made, or excuse me, in the film, he's saying he's not enslaved. He's indicating that he's been freed. In South Carolina during this time, there was a, a law in the 17th and 18th century where enslaved people were viewed as property. South Carolina law protected the right of slave owners to sell and trade enslaved peoples as they saw fit. This included private manumission. Though this was uncommon, any slave owner could unilaterally declare any slave which they owned to be free. Despite several revisions to the law, manumission was not expressly curtailed until 1800. Regardless, it's highly unlikely that Benjamin Martin would have manumitted his entire slave force and kept them on as paid workers.
So, Bannister Tarleton never shot a child, but it was reported that Captain Christian Huck did, though he didn't do it personally. On Sunday, June 11, 1780, some of Huck's men shot and killed a 17-year-old boy named William Strong. One, though likely sensationalized account, suggests that William Strong was reading his Bible when the incident occurred. So Thomas Sumter's house was burned historically by Bannister Tarleton and his legion on May 18, 1780. Tarleton was on his way to uh, overtake Abraham Buford as he and his Patriot Continentals tried to escape back into North Carolina. And en route, he stopped off at, at Thomas Sumter's home and he, and he burned it to the ground. Um, some accounts state that Thomas Sumter's polio-stricken wife was present at the time, but Sumter himself was not. It's interesting that when Thomas Sumter's house was burned, he had actually retired from active service, and he was acting as a representative in South Carolina's government. The destruction of his house did prompt him to rejoin the fight in much the same way that the burning of Martin's house and the death of his son are kind of catalysts that transform Martin from a, a passive patriot into an active one.
you might hit the button, but you're more likely to hit the button. Since we're in the first battle scene of the film, um, or major battle scene of the film, I want to talk about reload time real quick. Um, typically, if you were well trained, uh, you could fire a musket, like what the British would be armed with, uh, about four times a minute. It takes you about 15 seconds to reload and then fire again after every shot. Um, a rifle, on the other hand, would take you closer to a, an entire minute uh, to reload, and that's most likely what Benjamin Martin and his children are armed with, would be rifles. Um, so you see them shooting very rapidly in this scene. In reality, uh, the reload time, it would have taken them a much longer. On, the, on that British soldier's haversack, you may have seen the letters GR and a broad arrow. Um, that is actually just, uh, that's, that's the mark of King George. Uh, so George Rex, yeah, that, that's what Rex being uh, the Latin for king. Um, it's just to show that he owns all those things, including a man's haversack that he's wearing. Uh, it, is, it is the king's property.
These scenes are significant of the second floor um, of Aunt Charlotte's house it's, as it's the interior of the Homestead House. Uh, the Homestead House was completed in 1826, uh, at, located in what would become known as Historic Brattonsville. The parlor received, um, we'll see in here in a second, we're, we're actually going to go downstairs and you'll see where there's Delft tiles around fireboxes and, and chair rails were added to make these building, th this early uh, 19th century building look more 18th century. And this is what I was talking about, where they were adding um, some 18th century elements to a 19th century room. The parlor that you're seeing, and you can see the Delft tiles, the little blue and white tiles lining the firebox. Uh, that's very typical of the 18th century. Chair rails also oftentimes went around the room. Um, the space they're in was actually a, a wing added to the homestead house um, in the 1840s, um, and it's in a Greek revival style. One of the things I love about this scene specifically is, is location. So Mel Gibson is standing inside of the Homestead House, which is located in the, Carol, uh, the Carolina Piedmont, whereas Gabriel Martin is getting ready to go down the Avenue of Oaks uh, on Mansfield Plantation um, in Georgetown, South Carolina. Um, so it's completely different ends of the state, but they're shooting the scenes and, and it's syncing them together to make it, you know, again, a part of that movie, that movie magic to make a space or a place that doesn't actually exist conform better to the story.
another one of these great scenes of location um, is, is here. Uh, Gabriel is riding down a roadway covered uh, with these grand live oak live oak tree branches, um, clearly depicting the low country. However, he just walked into um, Hightower Hall, which is uh, a, another one of the historic houses at Historic Brattonsville. Um, Hightower Hall was built in 18, completed in 1854. Um, and they, they tweaked um, by, they tweaked this building by adding a, an inoperable door and covering up some of the, the uh, 19th century fretwork to make it look more 18th century. So the battle that Gabriel is watching outside this window, uh, this is the, uh, the, the Battle of Camden. Just as you're going to see here, the, the Battle of Camden was a Patriot route. However, the movie depicts a force of mostly Continental regulars. In truth, nearly half of General Gates' force would, ma would be made up of militia from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. So we saw, see a lot of regimental coats here, when in reality, we, it would have been a lot of militia. They would have been dressed in ordinary civilian clothing for the time period. Here we meet Lord Cornwallis. Um, he was the commanding officer of, of, the, of the British forces throughout during the Southern Campaign. Uh, and for whatever reason, the director and the writers decided not to change his name. They actually kept him as a historical character in this movie. Uh, the scene you're seeing now is actually filmed, uh, shot at Historic Brattonsville. The log structure you saw in the background are two of the log structures. They're not original to Brattonsville, um, but many of the log structures at Historic Brattonsville were actually relocated um, to the place um, for their long-term preservation. And they serve as a great backdrop here for this scene. Uh, this scene is where we see this kind of B storyline emerge with Gabriel Martin and, and this, this flag that we all recognize as the American flag, the Betsy Ross flag. But uh, it's important to note that there was no standard issue flag during the time. So we see this Betsy Ross flag in all the battle scenes. But in reality, uh, the flag would not have been flown nearly that much. Um, flags typically were familiar to the region from, from which a regiment uh, originated.
So this is the character Jean Villeneuve. He's played by Tchecky Karia. It's a fictional character, but he's predominantly based on the Marquis de Lafayette, um, but he also contains character elements of Baron von Steuben. So throughout the film, um, the relationship between Tavington and Cornwallis is very contentious, but in, in reality, I've found nothing in my research to indicate that, that the relationship between uh, uh, Tarleton and Cornwallis would have been as tense as we see depicted in the film. It's interesting that the fictional character of Tavington uh, blames his father for squandering his inheritance because uh, his historical counterpart, Bannister Tarleton, was the one who squandered his inheritance. When Tarleton's father died, he left Tarleton a legacy of 5,000 pounds. It was a small fortune at the time. Tarleton's newfound wealth did not last long because he spent the next two years after his father's death gambling it away.
Reverend Oliver is a fictional character that is predominantly based on a Presbyterian minister named John Simpson. On June 10th, 1780, he joined the local Fishing Creek Militia. I'm actually kind of surprised they didn't go ahead and just go full uh, reverend story and do uh, the Peter Mullenberg uh, story where basically he is, he's a reverend that is in his, the legend is that he's a reverend giving a sermon and midway through he takes off his robes to show his loyalties as a continental soldier. Um, I'm kind of glad they didn't because it shows, it makes it more personable. They're not pulling a lot of legend into it, although it's movie, so. They're, they're, they're taking a little bit of liberties with it, for sure. So as early as 1777, some colonies began enacting laws that encouraged slave owners to enlist their enslaved in the Patriot Army in return for their enlistment bounty, or allowing slave masters to use their enslaved as substitutes when they or their sons were drafted into military service. Uh, what's interesting about uh, Benjamin Martin's question to Oakham about can you write, um, an enslaved person knowing how to write in South Carolina in the 1780s was specifically prohibited it was outlawed by the negro acts of 1740 um so it would be a pretty it would for, for a for a black man to admit that he knows how to write to a white man uh would be a little bit of a precarious situation to put himself in so of course even if he could have written he would have definitely probably said no Uh, this actor is a man called Leon Rippey, and he's interesting. Uh, the movie was fought, shot primarily around the near the city of his, uh, Rock Hill, which where he is from. The story goes he was in town when his 30th anniversary was being held for high school. I'm sure he had some great story. He must have been the king of the of re reunion.
standard I actually built and use it just by the time the Army uh, even trained to take control of the deck and teach people new and aggressive military tactics. Uh, I mean, that's what you see happening in here in Egypt. We also see that this montage reflected in trying to get Roman guerrilla tactics used by many of South Carolina's partisan bands, such as the one led by Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter in Memphis, Tennessee. The, uh, the reward poster we just saw for the ghost is interesting. Uh, Cornwallis's name is actually misspelled on that poster. It's spelled C-O-R-N-W-A-L-L-A-C-E, when in reality his name was spelled C-O-R-N-W-A-L-L-I-S. Anyone at the time that was charged with printing a poster like that would have known the correct spelling of someone as high-ranking as Charles Cornwallis. Um, when filming ended, a lot of these props were donated to our organization, and I checked with our collections manager, and she looked at that poster. We actually have this poster in our collection, and she said, sure enough, Cornwallis's name is misspelled on the poster that we have as well. So when Dan Scott, who's played by Daniel Logue, states, quote, I don't like the idea of giving muskets to slaves, end quote, he's echoing a sentiment that's held by many white Southerners. Armed slave insurrections like South Carolina's Stono Rebellion in 1739 led to legislation that made it illegal for enslaved people to carry weapons without express written permission.
that scene there where you uh, is is shot at Middleton Place. However, what's unique about that is the main house uh, at Middleton Place actually was burned in 1865 by elements of the Federal Army during the American Civil War. So the house you saw at the top of the those uh, those tiers, which are original and in place in the Low Country of South Carolina, is actually computer generated to make for a better scene. So Tavington is seen drinking from a martini glass. However, the martini was not invented until the 1800s, and the martini glass itself would not become prominent until the early 20th century. So this scene is shot inside of the Colonel William Bratton house. Um, the main portion of the house is a log house uh, built in the 1760s. Um, the section that they're actually in is an addition that was added to the house, we believe in, the, in 1786. Um, but it's actually great because it's one of the few buildings that they're using. The interior shots is actually a, an 18th century house.
So when George Washington took command of the Continental Army, he banned recruitment of African-American soldiers initially. However, he quickly reconsidered this plan when states began to struggle to fill enlistment quotas. Before the war's end in South Carolina, uh, the, the colony had approved plans for raising Negro troops with freedom to be held out as a reward for service. What's also interesting about this scene, uh, the way that the characters kind of scoff at the fact that an, an enslaved man could not read, it's actually pretty common that a lot of white, uh, white Southerners also could not read. Literacy was not very high in uh, pre-revolutionary America. Um, in fact, the teaching an enslaved person to write actually was not outlawed in South Carolina until 1834 uh, at the start, as a part of the start of the abolitionist movement. They didn't want them to read those pamphlets. I, uh, I hate to be a buzz kill, but unmarried people in the 18th century probably would not have been engaging in public displays of affection like this. So I, I want to point out that, that muskets um, would have been uh, very inaccurate, uh, and flintlock pistols uh, would have been more so. So the idea uh, that in this scene several times you see uh, characters bullseyeing riders off of horses with their flintlock pistols, um, that's uh, in reality would not have been uh, as easily accomplished as we see in this scene.
so they mention Fort Wilderness a lot in this film. Fort Wilderness is fictional. The only Fort Wilderness to ever exist is a campground at the Walt Disney World Resorts in Orlando, Florida. So there's a lot to unpack in Benjamin Martin's story, so I'll try to do this quickly. Uh, Fort Charles did exist, though it was in Jamaica, not, uh, not in the uh, American colonies. Um, the massacre that occurred at Fort Charles in, in this film is a fictional one, though it's most likely based upon an actual massacre that occurred during the Cherokee War near Fort Loudoun in present-day Tennessee. After a six-month siege, the Cherokee captured the fort in August of 1760. The fort's garrison was allowed to travel to nearby Fort Prince George, but before they could arrive, the Cherokee attacked and killed 26 British soldiers. The massacre resulted in a retaliatory expedition against the Cherokee led by Colonel James Grant. 1,200 soldiers, including Francis Marion, burned 16 Cherokee villages and massacred any Cherokee man, woman, or child they found. In this story, Benjamin Martin also mentions Fort Ambercon, which is a fictional fort, and the Achillette River, which is in New Hampshire. So there was no stronghold in South Carolina known as Fort Carolina. However, Fort Carolina is most likely modeled after British strongholds that were present in Camden, Rocky Mountain, Hanging Rock. Um, I also want to note that, uh, that it's highly unlikely that the kind of gallows that we see here would have been used in revolutionary South Carolina. This style of gallows using a trapdoor is known as the New Drop Gallows. The New Drop Gallows made its debut in England around 1783, approximately three years after this scene supposedly takes place. Prior to 1783, a gallows would have been constructed with two upright beams and a cross beam. The condemned would, be, uh, would stand on a ladder or a cart or a box, uh, and a noose would be placed around their neck, and then whatever they were standing on would be removed. The house at the center of Fort Carolina is Stratford Hall, located in Westmoreland County, Virginia. The house itself was actually constructed in 1730 for Colonel Thomas Lee.
1782, the house would come under ownership of light horse Harry Lee um, through his marriage to Matilda Ludwell Lee. Lee would eventually uh, fall into financial ruin after the war, and would eventually, which would eventually result in the loss of family's ancestral home in the 1820s. These dogs are referred to at several points in the film as being Great Danes, but the term Great Dane would not have been used in the 18th century. Prior to 1878, what we think of as Great Danes would have been referred to as English Mastiffs. The English Kennel Club of Britain didn't officially recognize the breed Great Dane until 1923. So the tactic of targeting officers uh, is very effective for the Patriots during the Revolution. Um, Brigadier General Daniel Morgan ordered the targeting of officers um, on in several occasions uh, at the Second Battle of Saratoga on October 7, 1777, and then uh, again at the Battle of Cowpens on January 17, 1781, just to name a few.
I should note that, that Tavington's whole sentiment of not being able to return to England with honor, um, he is about to perpetrate some pretty some pretty interesting tasks. And it actually one of the main criticisms that um, viewers in England would have with this movie of depicting uh, English, English soldiers, English troops as being uh, so bloodthirsty. That's an interesting point, Joe. And, and a lot of the very personal attacks that Tavington's about to carry out against Benjamin Martin and his, and his family um, that that's very reminiscent of William Bloody Bill Cunningham who I was talking about earlier. Like we said, he's a loyalist, um, but Cunningham started uh, the war as a patriot and he defected to the loyalists in late 1776. In 1781, Cunningham and his raiders surrounded the house of Patriot Captain John Caldwell. Caldwell was seized from his house and hacked to death uh, in front of his wife before his house and outbuildings were burned. So again, all of these interior shots that you're seeing were actually shot on location at historic Brattonsville inside of the inside of the homestead house. The building you're the, the building that the children are in right there that is known as the assembly hall or dining room um it was a it was appended to the homestead house in the 1840s um it's interesting that they're using it here in this 19th century they would actually add some trim details to make the room fit into that 18th century style one of the things you'll note about there's people walking with torches inside of the house uh no open flames are allowed inside of these buildings they, they bent the rules a bit a little bit to to shoot these shots but my but uh, the way I understand it was there were buckets of water sitting in each of the rooms and they would douse the torches as soon as the scene was shot um, to cut down on the chance of fire in some of in, in these original historic buildings. Uh, the scene here, the child was hiding under the tables, I think one of the most memorable or one of the most memorable. And when visitors are on site, you know, that's something we point to and they always ask about that room. It's, it's still very much like that minus some of the 18th century additions. Big tables still there. The, uh, and the cupboard's on the side, so it's recognizable in Brattonsville. That is one of the clearest thinking kids to, to be like, oh, he's totally going to look underneath. <laughs> he's going to totally look underneath that. That thing gets, I'm going to scoot right onto the outside. I don't, I don't think most children, let alone adults, would have thought about, oh, I should, I should move to the other side because he won't see me.
So the exterior of Anne Charlotte's uh, plantation house, as we've talked about, is shot at Mansfield Plantation. Um, now, the main, the edifice that you're looking at is actually a portion of Mansfield Plantation. What the set builders actually did was they built a two-story uh, central portion, almost remis reminiscent of the Homestead House up uh, up in uh, historic Brattonsville. Um, and they did that so they could actually burn the plantation house down. Now, what you're noted now, what you'll notice as they pan out to the full view of the house, the only section of the house that they lit on fire was that main section that they built. The two wings, the the flanking wings on either side, are actually a portion of the original Mansfield plantation, and it and obviously they didn't want to burn that, uh, so they burnt uh, that two story edifice down. And the production crews actually had four fire engines on site because that that portion that they erected was so close to the house they didn't obviously want the original historic house to burn down uh, a mansfield plantation that plantation house was built in the 1850s I talked earlier about women's clothing being somewhat inaccurate, and you'll see the men's clothing as well. Uh, uh, you'll see them wearing very loose clothes generally. Their coats are looser than they would be. In the 18th century, uh, all clothes are made by hand for somebody so they could afford a tighter fit, and that's also a fashion. Uh, tight doesn't necessarily mean restrictive, but very much tailored. And also you'll see uh, randomly men without hats or with hats, without with hats, with hats. They uh, had something you wore in the 18th century, so unlike you'd see men walking down a road or anything like that, or certainly in battle without a hat. Uh, but again, it's some of those dramatic license that movies tend to take. So the uh, the community that we're seeing here of, of, of escaped enslaved people is commonly referred to as a maroon community. Communities such as this are surprisingly prominent in colonial South Carolina, though most were found in densely forested swampland, not on a, a barrier island such as, such as this. Um, the first evidence of maroon communities in South Carolina were reported as early as 1711, though these were relatively small. Evidence of more sizable communities, such as the one depicted in this scene, uh, are first reported in the mid-1760s. So like I mentioned earlier, this kind of personal attack that we see Tavington and his men carrying out against the Partisans and Benjamin Martin's militia, most likely based on attacks carried out by William Bloody Bill Cunningham. In November of 1781, Cunningham led his battalion on a scorched earth campaign against the Patriots. This campaign became known as the Bloody Scout. It's what earned Cunningham the nickname Bloody Bill.
These maroon communities were oftentimes in densely wooded areas. Here you're seeing it on a barrier island, as he noted, uh, makes it very conspicuous. Um, the idea is that these are runaway slaves. The last thing you'd want to do is be caught and put back into slavery. Um, so they would definitely try to be in a more um, hidden hidden location. Um, also, you'll see that they're, it looks like they're trying to cultivate crops on very, very sandy soil. Uh, it would not necessarily be good for that type of subsistence. I mean, not to dig into it too much, but you know, I know Halloween, they're, they're trying to make a good, a good quality movie, but sometimes they kind of miss some of the key things to make it just a little more believable. Yet again, this is an example of them taking kind of a, a much of a modern tradition and putting casting back in the 18th century. Uh, kissing the bride is not a tradition that were, they were they were the Anglican Church is really supporting, or the or the Presbyterian Church probably in the 1780s. Uh, also, the kind of celebration, the dancing scene, those are not not 18th century dancing. There's a lot of a lot more. Uh, this is much more of a modern kind of dancing style and party. Yeah, in fact, in the in the in the wedding liturgy, um, there's actually not a spot where the pastor pastor or priest will say, uh, "You may now kiss the bride." That 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 does that doesn't exist in the liturgy of a of a wedding service in that time period. Good point, Kevin. <laughs>
going back to some of Kevin's comments regarding clothing, you'll notice that Aunt Charlotte is wearing basic on the exterior, what would basically have been in an undergarment, um, which totally that is very un unformal. And she would have definitely had something covering that. Um, they're taking a little bit of a, a beach, <laughs> a beach, a, a, a beach uh, a, a approach to that, but that's definitely not 18th century uh, culture of the time. What is noticeably absent in many of these scenes that are shot in Pembroke, which is a purpose movie set. They built that on purpose um, out here in the Carolina Piedmont to shoot these scenes. What's noticeably absent is actually enslaved people, uh, a community, a house, a group of houses like this. It's a town. There would have people would have certainly owned enslaved people and they would have been all over the place. It would not have just been this one white village in the middle of in the middle of South Carolina where there were no enslaved people. In fact, the terminology, the black majority um, would have definitely had, there would have been a population of enslaved people living in and around this community. That's a, that's a great point, Joe. And um, they're noticeably absent in, in the early scene in Charleston as well. Uh, that's, um, that's probably one of my biggest complaints of the movie is the, the representation of, of the enslaved population or lack thereof. This scene coming up, I think, is the most over the top of the movie. Uh, you know, this is the events here are more more reminiscent. Say you would consider Nazi Germany World War II than 
then in the Clone of the Air, I think this is just above and beyond. Is uh, I think the director in the and discuss this thing is becoming the, the fictional truth of the scene, which I don't understand what that means, but it, uh, this did not happen. That, that's a good point, Kevin. I mean, uh, there is precedent for church, a church, at least one in York County, being burned. Um, we know that uh, on June 11, 1780, dragoons under the command of Captain Christian Huck burned um, Reverend John Simpson's Presbyterian meeting house uh, and his parsonage, but of course, uh, in that event, no one was locked inside. Uh, again, it's this is an attempt to really um, uh, polarize how uh, evil the British are. Really, really make make you hate the British in this particular this particular scene. But what is funny is that in actuality, even in even in the Revolution, the most heinous acts weren't actually perpetrated by British people. They were actually perpetrated by Americans, which is, which is really kind of the irony of this, but you know, you need, you need a clear good guy and a clear bad guy. And they're clearly <laughs> defining who the bad guy is with, with this scene. I met a visitor this year who talked about uh, they snuck on or got permission to go on the set during the weekend, and they were married in this very church. It kind of shows that uh, everywhere you turn, there seems to be a personal patriot story in the area. It was such a big event, uh, and it still lives large in, in people's minds, almost like it was like last week in some cases.
So again, uh, the, the movie creators are playing with the reload time a little bit. Uh, like I said, it would take probably approximately 15 seconds for Tavington to reload that pistol. And even with the slow motion we see in this scene, he wouldn't have had nearly enough time to reload.
So I want to point out the drummer boy we see in this scene. Uh, drummers in both British and Continental Provincial Regiments would have typically worn regimental coats with colors that were the reverse of the other soldiers in their regiment. For example, the soldiers you see in this scene have blue coats with red facing, so historically the drummer boy we see in this scene would have worn a red coat with blue facing. This movie, in many ways, comes. I think in, in uh, uh, his uh, peak of his career, he's held this run here. Mel Gibson was. He produced Braveheart in just five years early, and that won five Academy Awards, uh, best director, which he which he directed, and also best uh, uh, picture. And then after this, he films. He goes on to film. Uh, uh, we were soldiers once, just two years later. So these are kind of his three uh, three historic uh, dramas that really played well for the public and. and and I think cemented himself once again as a, as a powerhouse in Hollywood at that time. So the character that we see in this scene, this is General Nathaniel Green. Um, he was a Quaker from Rhode Island, which is kind of ironic because Quakers were typically pacifists. Um, Green took command of the southern arm of the Continental Army after Gates' defeat at Camden. Um, in this scene, Green is very critical of the militias, and this, this kind of pans as being accurate. Um, in his wartime correspondence, Nathaniel Green makes numerous derogatory comments about militias. In a letter to George Washington, Green talks of his, quote, embarrassment, end quote, at the, quote, loose and irregular manner in which the militia of this country take the field, end quote. Benjamin Martin uh, in this scene gives the direction to uh, fire twice and then, and then you can retreat. Um, this is a identical uh, order to one that was given by Daniel Morgan prior to the Battle of Cowpens on January 17, 1781. And this, this battle that we're about to see um, is a mix of the Battle of Cowpens and the Battle of Guilford Courthouse that took place on March 15, 1781. Um, both these battles used a very similar technique. Um, uh, Nathaniel Green was so impressed with, with the success at the Battle of Cowpens that he tried to duplicate that success um, at, at uh, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. So at, uh, at the Battle of Calpins, Daniel Morgan uh, arranged his troops in, in three main lines. The first line were uh, riflemen, which he uh, ordered to target the officers first, kind of like I mentioned earlier in the film. Uh, the, the second line was militia um, under the command of Andrew Pickens. And then the, the third line would have been Continental Regiments, and there would have been a cavalry back there under the command of William Washington.
make it feel more like a sport role by like making it bigger and so that they would not be having fighting uh, with the provincial army in this capacity. So in this scene, the act of luring the British into point-blank range of the Continental soldiers seems to be a very deliberate move on the part of the Patriots. However, during the actual Battle of Calpins, this moment was a lucky accident. The British flanked the Continentals on the right. Orders were given to turn and face the flanking British, but the orders were misunderstood in the heat of battle. Instead of turning to fight, uh, the, the Continentals began an orderly march away from the British. The British believed this to be a retreat. Daniel Morgan took the opportunity to order the Continentals to turn and fire point-blank into the British line that was pursuing them.
So unlike his fictional counterpart, Bannister Tarleton survived the war and he returned home to England. The worst injury that he would sustain was the loss of his thumb and index finger on his right hand when it was pierced by a musket ball at the Battle of New Garden Meeting House on March 15, 1781. After returning to England, Tarleton wrote a history of his experience in the war entitled Campaigns of 1780 and 1781 in the Southern Provinces of North America. He served in Parliament from 1790 to 1812 and died in January of 1833 at the age of 79. After the British lost control of South Carolina in late 1782, Bloody Bill Cunningham became a wanted man. South Carolina's government offered a bounty of 300 guineas for his arrest. He fled to Florida but was ultimately deported to the Bahamas where he died in 1787 at the age of 31. The only historical counterpart of William Tavington to actually die in the revolution was Captain Christian Hook, who was killed on July 12, 1780 at the Battle of Williamson's Plantation, also known as the Battle of Hook's Defeat. This representation of Yorktown is a computer-generated one. Uh, Cornwallis' headquarters is a conjectural rendition of Secretary Thomas Nelson's house. The Secre Secretary Nelson house was built circa 1725 and is believed to have followed the typical Georgian architectural tradition. Nelson had served in an official secretary position for the colony of Virginia since 1743. He remained in the house throughout the majority of the bombardment. Uh, the house was destroyed during the siege. Burwell, unlike his historical counterpart, Light Horse Harry Lee, uh, was not married and did not have a son named Gabriel. Lee did not marry until 1782. Um, Lee was elected to the Congress after the war and is, well, and is well remembered for a 1799 eulogy of George Washington in which he states, first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, a, a very notable and well-remembered quote. So much like his uh, fictional counterpart, Francis Marion returned home to find his house destroyed. Uh, so he built a one-story unpainted house on the Santee River and married late in life. But unlike Benjamin Martin, he had no children. 
He died on February 27, 1795 at the age of 63. After the war, Thomas Sumter was elected as a representative to the Congress of the fledgling United States. In 1801, he became the United States Senator and served in this position until his retirement in 1810 at the age of 76. He died on his plantation in Stateburg on June 1st, 1832 at the age of 97. And it looks like that's the end of the movie, fellas. Um, any final thoughts, uh, Joe? I mean, all in all, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a good movie. It's a good his, historic pi picture, historic movie picture for the 19, for early 2000. I mean, there's, I think, I think today would be made differently. I, I think the, 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 some of the historical inaccuracies with clothing and some of that stuff would probably be, would probably be addressed a little differently. Um, I definitely think I would hope that some of the, the, the things that we noticed about the, the portray the portrayal of African Americans and enslaved people in this movie would, would be addressed in a more thoughtful, a thoughtful way. Um, I mean, all in all, I mean, it's, it's a decent, it's a decent historical movie. There aren't a whole lot of them made anymore, I feel like. And, and, and it's, it is definitely ranks as one of the better ones. It's definitely better than what would have been made 20, 20 years before, before that was made um, in the 1970s. It, it's definitely better than one of those. Yeah, I, mean, I can I concur. I know that we spent a lot of the commentary um, kind of ragging on the movie, and I hope I hope people don't think that uh, that we don't like. It. I mean, I personally I love the movie. It's a great movie, despite some of the uh, some of the things we mentioned. Um, it you know uh, we've mentioned the representation of slaves or lack thereof um, in the film. Uh, I, I want to point out the lack of perspective. It's all very black and white. Uh, uh, British bad and Patriots good, and it, and it doesn't do a great job of bringing in some perspectives, specifically, as we noted, the loyalist uh, perspective. We get a little bit of that in the first scene uh, at um, the General Assembly meeting in Charleston. We, we, we hear some loyalists speak up, but for the most part, other than that one instance, uh, the loyalist perspective is completely ignored. Um, but I will say that uh, I think it's an excellent movie, and it it got people interested and drew their attention to a part of the revolution that um, doesn't get a lot of attention, the, the Southern campaigns, um, specifically in the Carolina backcountry. And um, so if nothing else, it drew people's attention to, to, to that. Uh, Kevin, what, what are your, uh, your final thoughts? Well, I think it's, it's a good movie. It's, it's kind of the, it's an era where movies got long all of a sudden. The movies were two hours long and this is, this is, you know, this is a three-hour movie, and today they, most movies go back down two hours. So, I mean, it define it is an epic, uh, and it shows that the grand sweep, the grand sweep, uh, large, uh, large scenes. I think this also movie kind of there's a lot of CGI in it, but it's done well. I think this kind of the birth of believable CGI, and the acting is very good. I especially love the the actor I think Tom Wilkinson who does uh, uh, Cornwall. Oh, very good. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. He, 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 his, the way he per, uh, portrays the gentleman, it, it, I think is just, it, it's, it's very believable. It, 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 it's just well done. Agreed. Yeah. And, you know, even the child actors, you know, you know, they're, they're new at the trade are all very good. Uh, you know, if you take the movie as the whole thrust of the movie. It's, it's very good. If you try to go in the individual stories, you know, doesn't hold water much because it's a fictional movie and they have fictional characters and fictional events. Uh, but it, I mean, it's a very strong movie. Uh, you know, I kind of second, you know, the treatment of African American story is not well done. And by the, and when this movie was built in 2000, it should have been better than two. And I think it's one of the criticisms. Uh, but, you know, it said it's a good movie. It holds up well. I think collectively uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks, you, all three has probably watched the movie 20 times. So, so I, you know, I, I still enjoy watching it. So that's a good sign of the movie. You know, I haven't gone completely tired of it yet. But. Yeah, and and I'll say, you know, we're t I, critiquing it like saying like, oh, is it does it still hold up? It it does still hold up. I think I don't think that there's anything in there that is totally glaring of like, oh, well, that's totally two thousand. I think you know it's made in two thousand, but it still holds true to most of the eighteenth century appearance. I think for what Hollywood could pull off. I mean. They spent $110 million on it. <laughs> so so a, pretty, a pretty big uh, price tag. Uh, you know, the fact that they had to build a lot of buildings, 
that they then burned. I think is, I, but but you know because they did that, it made it very believable, right? Uh, I I do think that they they definitely spared no expense, like you said, on the computer graphics for that time period. Pretty believable, right? I mean, they did a really good job on that, uh, and then the fact that they could burn down a lot of buildings and a lot of pyrotechnics to to give you kind of the the scale of war, uh, I think is I think is good. And for historic brands, but we love this film and why we're involved in this film today is, I mean, it really, uh, it really kind of got people coming to Brantonsville. People still come today, wanted to come see the movie place, uh, walk around. They want to know all about the Patriot. Uh, and that was 20 years ago. So it really helped Brantonsville, I guess, become larger people, public eye. Uh, and I guess, you know, may touched on it before. I mean, a lot of people, you know, credit this movie for really sparking their interest in history, which I think, you know, it's, you know, that's a great thing for this movie to do, any movie, to spike someone's lifelong interest in a, in a topic. Well, unless, uh, unless there's any other uh, comments from, from you guys, I guess, I guess we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening to the commentary. We, we hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you have any uh, questions for us, you can, you can find our email addresses at www.chmuseums.org. Um, you know, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.